Cemetery, so we're going down the list of Stephen King things to remake. So as long as we're talking about abducting... Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they better. I mean, oh, fuck. They're totally going to remake Misery. <laughs> Misery Live. That movie is so amazing. It is amazing, which why we might need to fuck it up by remaking it because we can't make oh, God. That is far and away Rob Reiner's best movie. Honestly, one of the best Stephen King adaptations. Perhaps better than The Shining. Uh, well, if we're talking about in terms of like an adaptation of it, then I might agree with you as a movie. I don't think so. I would say as a movie. Mm, we can differ there, but that will be like an entire podcast. I think that movie is beyond phenomenal. It's great. I'd love it. Yeah. The, the tension it builds is amazing, but like just cinematically, I think I like The Shining better, but that's just me. I mean, and then seriously, anytime Kathy Bates goes, Mr. Man. Yeah. Best line in film history. It's all it's of them really unnerving. Um, yeah, but I do hope they leave that the fuck alone. Attack of the mushroom people. I was just, I had a good transition. Set oh, up well, all right, okay, yeah, we'll go back. What you go <laughs> just, okay, do it. All right, go. You, you know, they're going to be scraping the bottom of the barrel though. When they start remaking like older movies that nobody even cared about when they came out, like exactly today's movie attack of the mushroom people. Oh my God. Here on the spectator film podcast. Oh God, Max. I didn't know this was a podcast. Yeah. This is so exciting. We do this every week. What are you talking about? Who am I? <laughs> oh God. We have the headphones and microphones and everything. What, what did you think we were doing? We we're just recording our inane conversation. Well, after you broke my legs with that sledgehammer, <laughs> I really didn't know what to think. Yeah. Sorry. So I don't know what joke we're on now, but this is the show. Welcome. <laughs> Who's on first? <laughs> uh, this is the Spectator Film Podcast, as you said. And yes. you are... Max, I think? Yeah. Yes, and I'm, I'm Austin. We, Welcome. We've taken mushrooms today, so that, that's why... We'll be changing of, throughout the episode. All of our jokes are nonsensical and weird. But yeah, no, we're doing the film Attack of the Mushroom People. Oh, is, should we pause right here and point out the difference, though? Yes, you should, because this is your pick, so you okay. introduce the movie and the differences that are out there. Well, okay, yeah. So to start with, like, the differences, it started from the debate of what to call this episode. Matango, which I think we both agree is a much more fun title to say. Uh, the inner person who loves, like, stupid American That's true horror too. movies in me kind of loves Attack of the Mushroom People. <laughs> it's very true. But as somebody who's like, oh, I want to make movies that people take seriously. Matango. <laughs> Matango is a Matango is just like a fun word. It's it like, is. Damn, Matango. Can we make that a meme? Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what it means, but hashtag if, Matango. If you set out to make a meme, I don't think you're ever going to succeed. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway. So... We had Matango or Attack the Mushroom People. What's the episode going to be called? Then we realized the only version we could find on the internet right now was the American AIP version, which went straight to, to TV and is t one of the worst dubs I think I've ever seen. Um, well, because there is like a... If you watch any Toho movies or Japanese movies in general from that time... It's famous, especially with their Godzilla movies, about how bad the dubbing is. Like, it doesn't sync up with the lips at all. Right. For this, I feel like they went in the complete opposite direction. Where they're yeah. Like, We're going to sync it up with the lips, even if it makes everything weird, terrible, and sound bad, and doesn't make sense. And you're like, why would they film. say that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a weird distinction. Yeah. I mean, either way. Uh, for a lot of the movies, at least as they exist in the U.S., I think the only copies you can readily find in the U.S. are the AIP versions of it, which is just awful. Toho did their own dubbing, never used. Uh, AIP distributed the movies in the U.S., and I think that's the one we watch usually. So it wasn't Toho, guys. It was just AIP being yeah. lazy. Um, but anyway, point is we realized we were watching that version, and that settled the question because we realize that it's also a different cut of the movie. Yes, which is very apparent in certain scenes. Yes, quite apparent. We'll get to that. <laughs> but uh, but yes, so the version we are watching, we are watching Attack of the Mushroom People. Um, I'll probably include Matango in the title just because I can't resist, but this is Attack of the Mushroom People. Welcome. Parentheses, Matango. Yes. And as you said, this was my pick. 
Um, this is the second Ishiro Honda movie we've done. Yes. Uh, I think he's a fun director to do because he can jump into a lot of his stuff and it's just like decent genre movies that also I feel like have been maybe under discussed in certain regards or just overshadowed by Godzilla. And, uh, this is one of those. I think it's overshadowed by Godzilla a lot. I know people, he's made a shitload of movies. So even in the entire, like, you know, catalog of Yoshiro Honda movies, this is one people talk about more, but compared to Godzilla and, you know, Godzilla franchise movies, I think everything else sort of is left behind a little bit. Well, yeah. Well, once you're known as a director who like has created this like gigantic commercial success, like it's going to take a lot for people to like look for themes and meaning in a small movie you did in between them. Yeah. Forget his movies that he made that aren't even like, fantasy sci-fi horror movies anyway like for like no one pays attention to those um i don't even know if you can find those but anyway yes you're absolutely right this movie however is one that i remembered uh watching for the first time from research for my horror project as with many horror movies that was the first time i watched it and uh yeah just left like a like a good feeling in my tummy um and i enjoyed watching it and was like that was sometimes clunky and sometimes cheesy and campy, but I enjoyed watching it. And I also felt like even though the movie hits it on the head a little bit hard at some points, the like mushroom, the way it uses like the the mushrooms as like a metaphor in that way, Yoshiro Honda particularly likes to do, uh, is, uh, sneakily effective. I think, I think mushrooms are a very good metaphor in this movie And um, even though the movie doesn't really capitalize on all the possibilities of how you might use that image, it's still interesting. And I think it just has some fun sets and stuff. So it's just a fun genre movie. It's a good movie for the spring, especially with allergies. Yes, definitely. Uh, So for me, I'm a, as I've mentioned before in our uh, Destroy All Monsters thing and just on various podcasts in general, I'm a huge fan of the Godzilla series, which means I've seen a lot of Honda's movies. Um, and the spinoffs where you have like, yeah, Mothra, who got her own series for a while and stuff like that. But when you mentioned this movie to me, I'm just like, okay, I've never even heard of this. So that's interesting. I'll give it a, yeah, a chance. And I watched it and I'm like, wow, this is, this is really good. I'm like, why haven't people ever brought this up? And it kind of has a darker tone than a lot of it. Like it's goofy at parts. Yeah, that's true too. It has a darker tone than a lot of it. And that got me interested. So I looked up, this came out 63. Yeah. So I was looking up what movies he had made prior to this. Um, I think the one, I know the one he made after was what, like Atragon. Yeah. It was just, a. but I was interested to see what he made before this, which, the two movies that came out he in 1961, I want to say, he made Mothra. Okay. Which is a, it's a very standard kaiju movie, but it's more of... I feel like it's got more of a hippie vibe. It does have a much more it. hippie vibe yeah. to it. But like, yeah, it's sort of save nature, save the world, stop destroying that. Um, and immediately after that, in 62, he made the famous, infamous uh, Godzilla vs. King Kong movie, which is... What was the other title you said? I think the one that shows up on iTunes is, or uh, IMDb is not Godzilla versus. What is the other one? No, there's it's like there's a bunch of no. I would that was a th- there's Godzilla versus the Colossus. Yeah, the Colossus because there's War of the Gargantuas and oh, Godzilla versus Frankenstein. It's <gasps> that's it. No, that, isn't... that's not the same movie. If there's, oh, okay. There, but like the German dub of Godzilla versus King Kong, there's like some weird thing about that. There's like, well, a, they they're all about Frankenstein. Yes, like there, a fun fact about the Godzilla kaiju universe. In a lot of the German dubs, there's like weird lines saying that Doctor Frankenstein created all the monsters. <laughs> He's the secret mastermind pulling <laughs> strings of the universe. If something's wrong, you just blame Frankenstein. Because they wanted to connect it to like that area of the world's mythos for those movies to try to sell them more. Oh, God, my toast fell on the floor. <laughs> yeah. This must have been made by Dr. Frankenstein. Dun, dun, dun. But no, it's it's weird. But yeah. He Point made, is, it's convoluted. Yeah, but Godzilla in versus King Kong is a very silly, dumb movie. Right. <laughs> so, you don't say. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Well, they'll probably never remake that. Next to. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine them ever <laughs> doing that. But next to like Godzilla versus Megalon with like the iconic image of like Godzilla flying, 
the other like stupid Godzilla gif I see the most is King Kong like forcing a tree down Godzilla's throat. Oh, I don't think I've seen that one. It's a wonderful, <laughs> stupid, stupid gif. That's pretty good. Uh, but so I feel like this movie is him being like, ah, oh, fuck, I need to like make a semi-serious movie with a message and a metaphor again. Let's do this in between my next Godzilla project. Well, it's actually neat that you say that because I was reading a decent Ishiro Honda biography and, and just skip to the chapter about this one. And I think he took like a solid like year and a half break in between making um, his previous movie and returning to make Matango. So it does sort of feel like a departure, I think, in a lot of ways, maybe because he has this different focus on it that he might not have had with a lot of other movies where he's like, that was just a factory line. He cranked those things out. He made yeah. like 30 Godzilla movies. No, definitely. Yeah. You can tell he's sort of like... Okay, <laughs> let's, and that's let's do like, something different. And the cool thing about Ichiro Honda is like how much he wasn't just a director. Like I, I think like a part of his career that I find really interesting that I still don't even know as much about is like his collaborations with like Akira Kurosawa towards the end of Kurosawa's career because those movies are like phenomenal. They're massive. They're... I think I hear Godzilla outside. <laughs> For those listeners who didn't hear that pick up on the microphone, there was like a jet plane <laughs> that just like some fucking broke the kaiju sound barrier just over fucking our broke house. the sound barrier over the house. I, that's never happened before. Okay, but uh, anyway, <laughs> um, uh, what the hell you were, were talking we? about? Oh, Honda yeah. and his yeah Kurosawa, which is awesome. Like yeah. that's a whole like other part of his career people don't talk about. And the fact that Kurosawa was losing his eyesight and the ability to manage such large productions. I don't want to take anything away from Kurosawa, but it's clear that like Honda was just a creative, talented guy in all sorts of ways. And it's neat to see him just like as a journeyman going through like, you know, it's weird to think of a guy who directed Godzilla, the first one as a journeyman, but he kind of was that. And he would just make movies and just sort of work it as like a craft thing. And I kind of admire that in a way that doesn't get talked about. So yeah, I think this is a fun director for us to sort of jump into every now and then. Um, it's also, we have various experiences with him and that I we, think you've watched more movies of his than I well, have. Just, just like out of sheer, like I've watched a lot of fucking Godzilla movies. But yeah. Like, like inevitably. Yeah. I mean, what have I seen? I've seen the first Godzilla destroy all monsters. This, um, what is the blue oyster? I think is the, the first like semi hit he had. That one's not even like a monster movie. That's just a drama type yeah. movie. Um, then I've seen this and I've seen, Oh, how can I forget? I've seen, uh, Godzilla's Revenge. Yeah. Our favorite movie. Where is it? <laughs> oh, there mascot. it is. It's right by the TV. See it? Yeah. <laughs> I always see it. It's there. I'm going to put it up. Staring at me. <laughs> mocking me. I'm going to tape it right behind you. That, just so you know there's eyes on you. That will be the you. last episode of The Spectator film. <laughs> Godzilla's <laughs> Revenge. <laughs> when we've had enough of doing this, we're like, fuck it. We're just going to do this and call it a day, guys. And then beat ourselves into a coma so yeah. that we get to live on Monster Island. That movie's nuts. Anyway, so I think I've seen about like five or six in total. But he's just got such a large catalog that is interesting. I guess the other thing that makes like him interesting to me, and this is something we've talked about with like the other movie we did of his, uh, Destroy All Monsters, um, is like you do sort of realize at a certain point the distance between what you watch as an American and like as a Japanese person, you know? What kind of message you'd be picking up on this? Yeah, just like what... There's certain like culture, especially with genre, because it works in like shorthand, right? And like really relies on your like the audience's assumptions about different things at that period of time. It's like there's a really wide gap between America and Japan, you know? Yeah. And as you were saying, there is a bit of like a cultural uh, railway between the two countries, especially now, but like still it's influenced by completely different sources historically. Like, yeah, their culture developed completely independent of the quote unquote West. Right. And because of that, like there are, and they've had different experiences, even if we're close allies now, like we utterly destroyed their country during yeah. World War II. And I mean, that's something that I think I missed the first time watching this. Yeah. Where I was really getting into it, but it maybe was more from a genre standpoint. And I guess whether it was just me at that point in my life or whatever, I, it didn't occur to me to think of Japanese movies in the 20th 
century as like movies that were made in like a post-apocalyptic society. Society. Yeah. Because that's kind of what it is. Well, in yeah. a way that I think it's hard for Americans to like relate to necessarily. Because yeah, because nu- yeah, nuclear weapon yeah, nuclear weapons are just there's there's something that happened very far away, and there's something that we have, and they stop bad things from happening to us because we have big guns, but like. No, when you're the victim of that, it's going to leave a cultural scar on every aspect of your society for the foreseeable future. and For generations, yeah. Especially movies that directly bring up radiation in them. You have to, you can't separate that context from whatever story the movie is trying yeah. to tell and do and when, it through that lens. When you watch a movie like this and other Honda movies, even if they're, they seem campy or silly at certain points, if you keep that sort of thing in mind and you like, you understand a personal part of it for the people making it. There's like a weird type of melancholy and pain yeah. in all of these movies that I don't think you detect otherwise, especially when you know that Honda was a soldier and he was like, he was like, they, I don't know. He didn't enlist. I think they forced him to like enroll in the, the military like twice. I think he got out. Well, then they forced him to well, go yeah, back. They started drafting like fucking everybody when they, the war started turning against them. Right. Yeah. He went to uh, Manchuria, I believe. But anyway, it's just, You know, it's neat to think of like the people making this as people who experienced that that apocalyptic event because that's really what it is. And uh, I don't. And we should say that, like, I I don't know. I I feel the need to say that, like, yes, we did terrible, terrible things to the Japanese. And while we're going to be focusing on that a lot in the podcast, I'm not going to pretend that Imperial Japan wasn't like didn't do awful things as well. No, but at the same time, like, we're viewing them post-war and them coming to terms with their identity now and what their place in the world is, which is a fascinating lens to look through the movie. That's often the subject of a lot of 20th century Japanese movies because of that. They were caught in a real cultural like rift where it's like, Oh God, we're being like, in a sense, like colonized by America. And, and we don't like that necessarily, but also there are advantages to that. Also, what does it say about us that they fucking destroyed us? What does it say about us that we got to the point where we were this militarized expansionist society in the first place? Because even then it was like a back and forth sort of cultural divide. Yeah. So you have like multiple waves of like, like collectively, like Japan trying to like figure out its identity or assert its true self, whatever that means. And then like just being destroyed in the process is like just this weird mayhem um, and especially for a lot of the filmmakers and artists who probably would not be too into uh, militaristic expansionism. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of something that I think you can find a lot of like, you know, a lot of, uh, I don't know, self-criticism as well, but just like a lot of like struggling to just find, to find like an identity. Truth. Yeah. Yeah. Like even in stuff basic as Rashomon right? That movie's not really about that, but ba- fundamentally that movie is about like what version of lo- like reality do you believe? Yeah. Is go the with? one do you have to go with? Yeah. So, you know, that's something that pops up a lot. So, um, I don't think we're going to be able to really grasp at the full depth of all these movies necessarily, maybe even ever, but we're going to try, we're going to do it anyway because we're rich. We're entitled white men. You were going to say rich. Yeah. You? And, then yeah. I, and then I remembered that I, <laughs> Could barely afford groceries this week, and I bit myself. Yeah, <laughs> one of those. Well, anyway. <laughs> oh God. Okay. Oh, well, on that note. On that note, let's let's breathe in the spores and turn into mushrooms. I don't have an intro for this. Let's just go. Let's, let's do this. Oh God, that's sinister music. <laughs> we were talking about that. If we have any uh, listening yeah, listeners who are hearing impaired or deaf or anywhere in between. Um, what the hell are you saying? Let me. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I was noticing yesterday that like the subtitles, like they say like ominous music and whatnot. And I'm wondering if you're hearing impaired or deaf, does that affect your view of the movie because for if you're listening and you don't have any trouble with hearing like music is something a lot of times if you're using it to build suspense 
it slowly builds up and you don't even notice it's there until it's coming to a crescendo and then it accentuates a moment. Right. You can't just sum it up in a parent parenthetical statement. Yes. So like, does that ruin movies for you? Is that actually a helpful thing? I'd be curious to know. Um, that's, you may have to ask them in some form other than a podcast. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I'm, that's what I was saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Was, that's, like, that's a dumb, that's a dumb question, but no, to be fair, like hearing impaired people at least can like, I guess so. Well, anyway, we missed that important opening for your question. I was going to create a uh, statement. Uh, well, create a statement. That's a weird way to say that. I was going to talk about how, like, one of the things we noticed watching this, the beginning of the metaphor and the importance of the framing device. Yes. Is uh, how Japan, well, Tokyo, in that sort of opening sequence, is very much something that you could compare to, like, an overgrowth of, like, mushrooms. And that, like, sows the seed so a scene of uh, how you might start to read this movie and how the mushrooms work as a metaphor. Maybe we can talk about that more throughout the movie. Cause I kind of do want to mention this jaunty opening too. Oh God. Well now I, can we just say that like the, the weird like cartoon sales posted over the frames with the credits on them are just like really dumb looking. I think that there's not much more to say about it. But it, it looks similar to the one from destroy all monsters. Kind of, except it's not stupid sales. <laughs> the reason they did that is uh, because uh, this is a big thing with Toho at this time. They, um, oh God, what is it called? Okay, they had an, an, an Oxbury optical printer for improved composite shots, and they used the fuck out of it. <laughs> it was very expensive, and uh, I think the only other company to have one at this point in time was, well, it was Disney. Oh, okay. Yes. So they were very proud of it. Yes, they were very proud of it, and they used the shit out of it. Why not? Yeah, they used it here. And for the most part, it looks pretty good. I think this, uh, this, this I was going to call it a rowboat, this yacht uh, <laughs> looks pretty solid. And then, yeah, we start, we start with that very grim, like, lamenting opening. And then we go to Jaunty Boat Adventure. <laughs> it's not just that. Is, is that the transition is like a star explosion transition? Yeah. Like it looks like somebody punching through the frame and it's like, it's like echoing out across the image. Don't leave the theater. Look at this fun movie. Yeah. Now, the other weird thing about it, we're getting introduced to our characters here um, who are very hedonistic and vapid and stupid. And that guy looks like the, the skipper. I think it's cool that he looks like some sort of MC or rapper from the 90s. I like that. They, they all got their style from that one guy, obviously. Well, yeah, he's the captain. He's in charge. But then we have, like, it might be explained, but, like, we have guy and girlfriend. Um, uh, Kira Kubo. Yes. Who are our protagonists because they're the ones who live the longest. Well, he's the one telling the story. I guess yeah. he's ours, um, our protagonist. But they're just students. and like the Well, other- she's a student. He's a TA. Yeah, still. Kind of a student. Um, <laughs> or is he? I don't know. He's a professor of some sort. What's your question, though? But, like, it's just weird that, like, this head of a company. Oh, how are they I mean, friends? You yeah. Mean? Yes, that's quite uh, an interesting question. I don't know how this, uh, this group met. <laughs> they certainly don't seem to be very good friends underneath, don't they? Well, no, that's the whole thing is just like, oh, once society collapses, we're all going to start fucking eating each other i guess that is one way i mean obviously the cardboard the the cardboard cutouts the characters in this are cardboard cutouts the cardboard cutouts are characters <laughs> yes um but that's definitely that would be commentary for the movie we did last week toby damn it right yeah. yes that's a that's a teaser for anybody who didn't listen to that one uh but like obviously that is something that we miss out on this movie is so focused on portraying them as vapid and stupid we have this girl singing the like sing-along song yeah which also we had a good laugh when she started playing the <laughs> the, the like the ukulele. ukulele thing and then it's non-diegetic mu- or no it's diegetic music and then it just becomes the track she puts it down and yeah it's just like oh well i started it so the movie will carry it on as i sing it is an interesting moment though i guess it really does help sell like the hedonism of these people well yeah but, but they're like, so shallow that it's like you can't also, ever buy that they liked each other that also comes across as like a studio executive being like, uh, the people say we like, they like, uh, m- music in their movies. They like the, the, like girls singing. They'll put that in the beginning of your film. Yeah. I mean, also, I mean, it is a weird thing. I get the impression from the chapter that I read that, uh, y- you know, studio execs for Toho weren't 
like 100% keen on giving Honda this type of project. Yeah. Usually they would reserve him for stuff that's more like, you know, fantastic. I mean, this is having mushroom people, but like, but like stuff like Godzilla, which at that point was even at this point was not, not like some sort of brutal examination of Japan. It was silly. It was silly. Yeah. Ultraman equivalent of just like, Oh, we're going to get this thing and it's fun for the whole family. Yeah, but um, I think it is interesting to compare this maybe to like, as we talked about the opening of and character introductions of like a slasher movie and how that works. Um, It's a little bit different, but I think the principle is the same where it's like these people will, there's a relationship between like the lack of awareness and like vapidness of these people and the conflict they're going to uh, sort of come into contact with well, we just later had, in the movie, we just had that dialogue where the guy's just like, oh, we're getting away from all of humanity. And the girl's like, aren't we humanity here? And, she, and he's like, yeah, but I think we're different than the run of the mill people. Sure. And they're not. Do you get it? Well, I think it's interesting because the movie, I think the framing device is key to this movie. Right. Because you wind up with like at the end, obviously, the synthesis of this island in Japan. But if you really think about it, the like similarities are very deep in that. And it begins with this island being affected by radiation and then also Japan being affected by radiation and like the contrast of like the different outcomes. Whereas Japan and like Tokyo, as we see it, is colonized by, you know, American influence and American ideology and capitalism this island is colonized by these radiated mushrooms, right? And they go hand in hand with one another. And uh, I think that's why, that's like the start of like the sophisticated like image that the mushrooms are in this. And they, I think it works really well in a way that's maybe in some ways more effective than Godzilla. To, yeah, to a degree. Like we'll, yeah. we'll get in more to this as like the mushrooms are actually introduced and they start affecting the characters. But like if you want to view the mushrooms as a representation of not just like the nuclear scar that America left on Japan. Right. But also as like a sort of quote unquote Western capitalist, like emergence that happened because of that. Yeah. It's like bloomed in the wake. Exactly. It it does really interesting things with that because it, again, much like we talked about with our destroy all monsters thing, you can maybe compare this. You can like, you can set this up with the comparison between the American monster movies of large animals and kaiju movies and why those are different. And it's like the idea is in the American ones, as you know, uh, is that there's a very clear line between us and them. Like you can, and them, them, them. Oh my God, them. Uh, but there's like a strong sense of othering. You can clearly delineate your protagonists and everything from the villainous monsters. Is there a better monster sound in history than like the weird squeaking ant noises from them? I just love it so much. Hmm, I'd have to let you know. Okay, well, let us know in the Kathy Bates, when she goes, Mr. Man, that's scary. (laughs) That's calling her a monster, though. Anyway, she's monstrous. So yes, there's a difference between, like there's a very strong othering between us and the monster. Right. It's very easy to like morally position yourself as like displacing badness and evil onto those monsters. Whereas even though if like, even though like a scientist might have some sort of responsibility in creating them generally in most of those movies, it's either easier to displace the moral ambiguity and just make it simple. And usually that scientist gets his comeuppance. Yeah. And then like the strong white man in the U S military make everything right again. Yeah. But like with the Kaiju, as we discussed, there's more of like an ambiguous relationship that also develops throughout the movies too, where they literally like team up and protect humans at certain points. But even from the beginning, it's more of like, you know, like there's like some recognition that society is somehow responsible for this creature's rampage to a certain extent, or they have contributed to it or that it would not happen if we had not been the way that we are too. Right. Yes. There's, there's sort of an embracal of it. Um, whether it's not, whether it's either was once us or we caused it. Um, do you want to pause for that psychological insight? Oh God. Do you want to repeat that back to anybody who's not watching this? Oh yeah. So there's a wonderful line of dialogue, which comes out of nowhere and serves no purpose. Cause In the middle of a fucking horrifying storm. Yeah. They're trying to take down the sails so that their boat doesn't get blown away and they all die. 
Um, the writer says to Akira Kubo. Yeah, the, the writer says just like, oh, you're a psychology professor. You know that if you pretend you don't like a woman and then you shower her with affection, then she instantly falls for you. And the writer just goes, or the psychology professor goes like, no, that's just something you use in writing. That's not how real people work. And then it doesn't do anything doesn't at all. It just sets him up as a it. scumbag, I guess. Yeah. Like it's the weirdest moment to well, include Max, that. She has to. If you do that, she has to do that. Yeah, she has to. Yeah. <laughs> that scene. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Where they're trying to use the radio. <laughs> the radio explodes. It explodes on fire. Just and pour water. water on them. That yeah. seems like Sam Raimi came in and directed that. And they're like, let's find a way to just make the actor like endure us pouring shit on him for like five seconds. Just for like a cutaway shot, but he'll be like wet or something for an hour. It'll be great. But you were talking about the othering of monsters. Right. And I think that is important to take into our understanding of nuclear weaponry as Americans versus Japanese. Um, because for most Americans, those types of weapons are something that happened far away and that we have control over. Right. Um, we don't use them anymore. It was fine. We had to use them once, but it's okay. And, it's not our, it's not our responsibility it's almost a direct like inverse relationship yeah where americans That's i feel like I getting it yeah, yeah in the cultural imagination tend to associate like the end of world war ii which comes with the dropping of the bombs yeah. with the type of entrance into utopia for like fucking idiot americans or just really old white men um, it was whereas, the golden age where we ruled the world stage now yes and everybody had a barbecue in the backyard and a car isn't that great? But anyway, you know, that's like the exact opposite of Japan, which is like, it's apocalyptic. Yeah. So you have like the switch on both sides. It ends your culture. And then the people who unleashed that horror on you rebuilt your society. They're colonizing you now. Yeah. yeah. And then, so it's very interesting to notice that radiated monsters in Japan are either former people or they were caused by the society right. themselves. Whereas in America, it's normally just like, even if we did create them, the guy who created them was rogue and he gets his up. And we have the power to defeat them. Yes. We can always stop them. They're never, completely. we have autonomy. They're a threat, but we can take care of them. Right. And usually you'll get the girl along the way. Yes. Everything will be the way it should be. <laughs> by the way, we didn't mention it, but during that storm, you're going to see some great work by the, the amazing AG, uh, super who is the guy he's like, the other side of Ishiro Honda movies um, where he was often, often very involved or in charge of uh, a lot of the miniature work. Um, I think that you can find some pretty good books on him as well. I've never read one. Um, I just know that he was very much directly involved in a great deal of Ishiro Honda's, you know, most memorable movies. And yeah. uh, he's worth talking about as well. Cause he was a very smart guy. I mean, if you remember our destroy all monsters <laughs> commentary, we're, yeah, fawning over the miniatures in that movie constantly. I mean, all of these. I mean, the miniature, yeah. we were talking about this too, just during the prep screening with that storm. Yeah. How impressive that is because it's so hard to replicate water at a different scale because you can just see that it's like the wrong scale. Yeah, it's not as impossible as fire because fire is fire. Fire is really hard. Yeah. yeah. Fire is fire. And if you light a match, it will look like a, a match, match flame, yeah. no matter how close you zoom in on it. Um, but yeah, water, because it breaks... Yeah, in different ways and very visually, uh, depending on how much yeah, water there is. If you put, if you get a miniature boat, it's going to look a lot of times like you're playing with a toy boat in a bathtub. Right. So you need to get it bigger. You need to get certain conditions. And if you can pull it off as well as they did in that, it looks really, really good. Yeah, you can see. I, I know we talked about this, but we traced a direct line between that and probably the end of the two towers is like two really fantastic uses of miniatures yes. and, and water. Uh, oh God, that's a creepy doll. Fuck. I didn't even fucking see that. That's the real villain of the movie. That looks like the, the showbiz creepy. pizza monkey. That's what that is. Look at it. It's yeah. got like the little rainbow hat and like everything, the red and yellow hat. Jesus. If we keep having to put quarters in the red letter media jar, we're going to fire. Yeah. We can hire a new host. God, they're going to sue us. <laughs> they're going to sue us for talking about a company that no, they saying. don't own. They might as well. Yeah. And it's like they find the deed to showbiz pizza for like $20 <laughs> online. 
<laughs> oh god is there a website we can find where we just grab up deeds for like old shit yeah why not that's how you become landlords right definitely that's how your landlord became a landlord don't let him listen to this yeah no i don't think he is <laughs> But anyway, Jesus, um, I guess the point we were building to, though, is that this movie takes that relationship between the protagonists and the monster and makes it even more concentrated in terms of their responsibility towards it, because these people are like very much enjoying the luxuries and benefits of Western society. Right. And uh, I think this movie very directly has that relationship between like the glamorous life of Tokyo now. And like the underside, which is, are these mushrooms. And it's saying it's, it's part of the same thing. You don't get one without the other. Right. And I think one thing we talked about is like the weird hypocritical nature of their like suffering in this, because it's like, no, 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 you're just upset now because you're now in a different part of the structure of this society. Yes. But this always existed and this had to exist in order for you to have your former life. Very true. I, I wanted to pause just for one second because you brought this to my attention yesterday. Oh, this boat yeah, sequence? Yeah, where this is like, because in most of Honda's movies, like things are always like literally happening in the world. There's not very like fantastical like, yeah. or supernatural things happening. It's just like, now there is a giant lizard. Like that that's what's happening right now. But like, right. no, this is like a fear induced hallucination just by this guy having a breakdown from being on the open water with no rescue for too long. Yeah. I, I, you know, I can't really think of a lot of other Honda movies where the like, there's like purely psychological yes. factors going on. And even that's something that happens throughout this. Um, you get like flashbacks and everything too. And, uh, I think that's also a feature of the story. This is based on, this is based on a, like, I think a story called the Isle of Fungus by, uh, William Hope Hodgson, which I also read, before this, this is two weeks in a row now that I've read a short story that is like it, not entirely relevant to the movie. Yeah, I was going to say, did that contribute anything to your understanding or no? I mean, in that there's fungus on this island <laughs> and people get stranded and they eat it and it has like decaying effects on them. It's not like they become mushroom people. I don't remember. I don't know. I'll yeah. link to the story, whatever. A big disappointment. Read it or don't. Your story don't can always be improved by mushroom people in it. Uh... Name a movie that wouldn't be improved by the inclusion of mushroom people. <sighs> Triumph of the Will? Uh, I don't know how you'd fit that in there. I, I would actually enjoy watching Triumph of the Will if it had mushroom. be a big question mark, wouldn't it? If there was just like some random mushroom person standing in the <laughs> crowd. You just, Hitler was a mushroom the entire time. Yes. Why not? Just like, yeah, slowly have like spores growing on Hitler's face until he's a full mushroom person by the People end of People just it. look at each other awkwardly. What's going on? No, don't say anything. It's fucking Hitler, dude. Or somebody, I'll they just us. cut to somebody else and he's like licking his lips. I might actually like enjoy Lenny Riefenstahl if she like for some reason included mushroom people in her fucking horrific Nazi propaganda film. Oh, God. That was not the turn I was taking. I was, yeah, I wasn't expecting to talk about that either. You brought one up. I, I know. I gave you the opportunity to choose any movie, and you chose Triumph of the Will. What was that? Or it was like The Land Before Time. And I'm like, well, that just doesn't make sense. So put it in Triumph of the Will, because at least there's people at the, that, that. There's no people with That's the dinosaurs. That's a wide range. <laughs> The yeah. first two movies that come to your head. And it was you know what? Triumph of the Will and Land Before Time. It was only going to be those two. <laughs> only those two. I knew in my mind. And so I took the best choice I had. That was like, I did an exercise where like talking to different people and asking questions. And of course I got the question of what your, what is your favorite movie? Um, so I was talking to like, just like regular college kids and they were, look, they still have their hats on here. Yes. Sorry. The hats will never come we off. We just noticed this, but they all managed to have their hats, While shoes swimming. and sunglasses on all the time. But it's like I got whiplash from like people being like, oh, my favorite movie is like Saving whiplash. Private. Oh. Yeah, Save It Private Ryan or Titanic. And I'm like, okay, these aren't movies I like, but I get like why those are your favorite movies. To like having somebody be like, no, Cat in the Hat, that's my favorite movie of all time. This like, is the second time this mysterious person who likes this movie has been mentioned. Yeah, but I don't think, I think we did it before the podcast and not like actually on it before. No, I had to add in a correction. Because we thought it was maybe Dean Cundy who shot that movie, but it was actually Emmanuel Lebesky. <laughs> Weirdly enough, 
The other weird <laughs> connection about that movie is that it was directed by the production designer of Beetlejuice and Men in Black. <laughs> it all comes back, Max. Yes, it all comes back to Cat in the Hat. <laughs> Which There's- is another movie with mushroom people that might make it better. Yeah. <laughs> I think just mushrooms might make that movie better. <laughs> That will be my one hallucinatic mushroom joke for this podcast, everyone. The end. Or maybe not, because I that, for me, has to do with why mushrooms are an effective vegetable to choose. I was going to talk about that vegetable? a Vegetable? Well, shut up. Uh, compared to, like, any sort of plant, right? Why is it mushrooms? I was thinking, like, why is it not broccoli? <laughs> Other than that just sounding stupid. But, like, the thing from another world, that's an intellectual carrot. Yeah. <laughs> so you can make jokes, and it does sound stupid to say that, but they were actually doing that. So why is it mushrooms? And I guess one of the features of mushrooms is they are associated with being a hallucinogenic, right? Yeah. Which is kind of similar to this idea of ideology, right? It's the idea of internalized ideology, that these people are accepting. Because I think one of the things about the relationship between this island and the mushrooms and like Tokyo in this movie is that because they're so connected, it's very much not like a transformation so much as it is like who they are already in this movie is taking on a different form that's just like a visible bodily form. But they've already been colonized is the thing. And they've already been taken over and made quote unquote mushroom people. Well, yeah, and then if we're going to do another reason why mushrooms make a good thing for this, you have, like, the literal visual symbolism of mushroom clouds. Yeah, that too. Which is a dominating theme, as we've mentioned in Japanese cinema at the time. Yeah, but, I mean, we get that sequence later where it's like, you know, he finally takes the mushrooms, and we see it from his perspective, and it's those bright neon lights of Tokyo, and then just women, like doing sexy dances yeah and if uh, i was gonna save this for later but if we want to get into this now like no let's do it later i don't know what you're about to say but let's do it later i have no patience for it right now or we could do it now you know it's up to you as i was saying um if you want to you don't have to but this is the way i'm viewing this movie the lens i'm viewing it through Mm -hmm. um if you want to view the mushrooms this irradiated unnatural invasive force that like eventually they all succumb to in one way or another. Right. Um, if you want to view that as Western capitalism culture slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Consuming all those who were resistant to it at first. The fact that when they eat the mushrooms, they are no longer hungry. The fact that when they eat the mushrooms, they are finally happy (laughs) when they eat the mushrooms they lose themselves, but they get what they wanted from it, and they continue to exist. And even when our one main character escapes that, he still has this thing of just like, I would have been happier if I just went back to the island and ate the mushrooms, because I at least would have been with everybody. So if you want to view that as Western capitalism, like slowly consuming Japanese culture and just sort of like erasing who you once were, at the cost of you have food to eat, you have a country and a culture or like a community again. I find that to be a very interesting lens to watch this movie through. Right. Well, I feel like that's literally what we've just been talking about though. Yeah. It's like, that's how it works. Like in the weird thing about you putting it that way though, too, is like putting it that way really emphasizes the idea that it, it's a weird type of like coercion, but they still have, have to participate in it. Yeah. Two, so it's like there's on multiple levels they have this responsibility for buying into this, but also this movie seems to acknowledge that it's like once it's there, what else are you going to do? You know, how can you? This is the thing. It's like people talk about in America, like idiots in America talk about you don't like the way a company behaves, go do something else. Yeah. You know, oh, you want to change your internet service provider? Uh, oops, whoops. Oh, I guess don't use the internet. If you just want to make a statement, just put them out of business. Don't give them your money. So don't use the internet. Oh, God, that doesn't work too well, does it? Yeah, that's like whenever you see like those baby boomer hot takes of just like, oh, you're criticizing capitalism on your iPhone. I'm like, well, 
you, you realize that like smartphones are a necessity. There's not an alternative. Yes. Like, yeah. You can't opt out of capitalism. You like, know who can afford to be successful and like live a managed life without like a smartphone or something like that? A capitalist. <laughs> Fucking rich people. Yeah. That's who can do that. People who have that and do it fucking for them because they have secretaries or something. So, yes, you have to. That's a privilege. Yes. Even if you don't want to, you're eventually going to have to succumb to this. Yes. You have to participate. Yeah. These these are really great. Even if you do manage to get away, then there still might be a tinge of regret of just like, oh, I'm missing out from all the happiness and fun that those people are having. Well, I think it's just more that like, he's so demented at that point that he just doesn't even know what to do. I, that's why the, like the arc of this movie is not, again, it's not like transformation so much as it is like defamiliarization that changes their perspective on who they are already where he's like, Oh God, it's, it's better for me to remain here in the like new position we're in than to try to go back and occupy the old one. Now that I have been changed, and I see how like shallow it is. Yeah. Is part of it too. Oh God, this is just a great creaky old ship set. It is fun. Get one of our favorite lines in the movie here. The steps are slimy. There's a lot of things like where it's just like, was that, I don't know, dub, I feel like some dubbing took I mean, over. that is not even the weirdest moment of it. Yeah. I think the first time we noticed it was one of the first lines when they're on the boat and the writer says, you shouldn't say that about Tokyo. It's an important place and lots of good people are there. We're like, did he actually say that in mm-hmm. Japanese? Like, this is the first time where I've watched a movie and it was like, oh my God, there really is like such a palpable like language barrier that I don't even know how like much of a barrier that is. There's one moment later on. It's a small thing, but like from the very minimal Japanese that I actually know, like I could, okay. I could tell like what the person would have, yeah, would have been saying in Japanese. And I'm just like, Oh, uh, from their mouth. Yeah. To a degree in the context of it. Um, what was it? It's just a small little thing where, uh, the two girls are out gathering water and the guy comes up and she calls him a fool. Oh yeah. I think that, what I saw was the Japanese word baka, which just means like in general, just sort of like dumbass idiot, just something like that. Um, it's just like you took a lot of liberty. Fool just came off as like, you don't just like when somebody startles you, you're not just like fool. <laughs> right. It's like a really strange, just like what it completely the f- neuters. Yeah. Like the point of what you're trying to say. Although yeah. even that I would be suspicious of like, no, I feel like that would be a small example compared to it other is. things I, in this movie. It is. It's just something that I noticed. Yeah. That's With why the I, like horrendously limited yeah. knowledge of Japanese that, that I have. have. Yes. Yeah. Well, both of us have it. Do you? I mean, between the two of us. Yes, two of us. We have a horrifically terrible knowledge of Japanese. Yeah. Weirdly, this reminds me of the beginning of Alien vs. Predator. Oh, God. Why did you remind me of that movie? <laughs> I don't know. For those of you, well, none of us, none of you know, but uh, when we were trying to get our bearings and like figure out how to do this podcast, we did a double feature of Alien versus Predator and, and Predator versus Alien. Yeah, and we uh, watched it backwards. Roland em- and probably would be improved that way. We um, should do that for some movie, definitely. But uh, and Roland Emmerich's Godzilla, and it was just fucking. I had forgotten like how terrible Alien versus Predator is. It's better than Godzilla, but we should end this conversation right now yeah i think i was just delirious by the time we got to godzilla so although we should mention that if you want to hear max make some really amazing threats to paul w anderson you got to listen to our event horizon episode (laughs) and that's all i'm gonna say (laughs) it's the most threatening thing i've ever heard in my life (laughs) i forgot about that okay yeah go listen to that oh god yeah they just discovered that black hole time to retweet that get that trending no yeah I wonder why the mole I opened, Paul. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) It's the stupidest thing I've ever said. I think that was genius. I think that's the best moment of our podcast. (laughs) Well, I'm glad. No, what's interesting is that if somebody hasn't listened to that, they're probably going to have to stop this. Go listen to that. I think it's like an hour in about i think it might be close just so to you the guys end. can find it oh look matango 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 there it is i really like that font 
not that they like typed that out, but just the way they wrote that on that crate. That doesn't look like a sailor. That looks like somebody who <laughs> is like really good at doing like. And they they instantly like blame the fungus for everything, which is weird because like if I found this, like I get after they find the captain's log, that it's just like okay we have a reason to believe that the. Fungus, what would you think it was? But like they're just like oh it must have like done this. I'm like I would just just assume that this is a fucking old boat that's been here forever and fungus has spread over it because of that. I wouldn't. Be that's like, what they're saying. Or do you think they're saying, like, the fungus fucking destroyed the ship? To a degree, like, yeah, they're just, oh. like, they're paying way too much attention to it. Like, it, it's the whole, like, I know I'm in a movie about mushroom people syndrome. Yeah. And that, I, I like that. I like the idea of just, like, oh, they took the yeah mirrors off of the... It's a decent detail. If they didn't bring it up again, if they just sort of left that hanging... It is weird they bring it back. And yeah. it's like randomly in the woods that they smashed mirrors. Are we missing something or does it just do that? Also, we were a little bit confused by this, but red is creepy. So yeah. we opened it and somebody, yeah, whatever. somebody put a red gel over the light in here. It's terrifying. We're trying to think of why this room would be red. What was the closest thing we got to? Well, like there's, I would get it. it like, was there a body? Is that he supposed to be? He killed himself. Is there blood over the, the windows? windows? Like, yeah. Is there blood? Is it that supposed to be blood, or is it just like the light hitting the fungus? Like he'd have to shoot himself at a really specific angle. And there's to get no. Both and there's windows. no body. Like, unless it became a mushroom. Yes, unless it's like been fully absorbed into the fungus. But like, well, this is the other interesting thing too. If we're going to look at the like mushroom image, maybe we can start jumping into this. Is uh. These people become mushroom people, but are the mushrooms they're eating former people? Is that a possibility as well? Do you become a mushroom person and then eventually just break down into different mushrooms? It's like a mode of like reification almost in this metaphor. It could be almost, but like, I don't you know. You become the thing that is absorbing you. And the mushroom people won't tell us because like all they do is laugh constantly. Yeah. That's the weird other thing about this title is that the mushroom people never fucking attack anybody. Yeah. The, the other people encourage you to eat mushrooms, but after you become a mushroom person, like you hug somebody and then you're laughing a lot. Yeah. And that's, I think that's like key to it though, is like, it's not going to try to like dominate you by attacking you. Yeah. It's just like, it's pure, like, like this weird coercion to be like, just join us, you know? <laughs> What's your alternative? Come on. Yeah. Just do it. They cleaned up very quickly. Yeah. Also, we didn't mention that this ship in many ways is uh, treated by uh, critics who have written, written about this movie as um, another instance of uh, Honda referencing the Luck and Drag Lucky Dragon number five, I think it is, which was, again, that uh, sort of, I guess, what, fishing vessel that was caught downwind of U.S. atomic tests in the Pacific. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Where this movie was... Um I believe like it had, I'm not sure if it was actually banned, but it had some trouble in Japan upon its release. I think it was not a big hit. Yeah. No, because like a lot of places didn't want to show it because the initial mushroom person that we see with like the, yeah, like the bumps on his face looks disturbingly like victims of radiation. Oh but yeah. Poisoning and the like growths and shit. They got, Oh, I face. didn't see that. So yeah, I did some research about this when I was looking up some of the other movies made at the time. So yeah, this was a bit controversial when it came out in Japan because of that. Yeah. I mean, I, again, he's pulling on something from the, you know, cultural consciousness with using this abandoned ship, right? That's there to like yeah. study radiation. Um, but yeah, so that, I think that originally when that happened, it was right before Godzilla came out in like 54 to the point where they were still making Godzilla and they were thinking about altering the script to maybe incorporate something like that. But they thought it was just a little bit too on the nose testy Yeah, to, to they'd be testing their luck. And ultimately, they made the right decision to not do that because uh, there may have been no more like successful movie domestically than the original Godzilla. Where I think if you look at the stats for the original Godzilla, one in ten Japanese people saw that movie, which is kind of insane. Yeah, you get ten percent of the population to see one movie when it's out in the theaters is nuts. And we're all going to die. So we better start eating mushrooms. What do you think about mushrooms? I know we talked about this a little bit, but 
Do you have any thoughts about like oh like eating mush like the food mushrooms? Yeah. Um. I like I I, I know we had talked about this a bit yesterday, but like I I don't eat uh, beef or pork. Um. But but portobello portobello mushroom burgers are fucking clean. I love them. They're great. Um. Other than that, for just like stuff that just regular, they're okay on pizza. I don't mind them. Um. You throw them in some salads, they're okay. But like. I'm neutral on most mushrooms, very pro portobello mushroom. Right. I will go on record saying I am pro portobello mushroom. Yes, and uh, we tried to find some mushroom cocktail recipes to no avail. Yeah. Apparently that's not as big of a thing as I thought it might have been. Also, Austin shot down my idea of us just stripping balls for the podcast. So um, Yes, because people want to listen to that. Yeah. Uh, I feel like there's probably a market somewhere for that. When our brains are working as they should... We're not nearly entertaining enough to justify like telling people they should listen to us. <laughs> when we're impaired, I can't even begin to ask people to like pretend we exist. So, well, what's this? There's there's my evil twin, Hippie Max. What, what do you want to say? It's like, well, man, fucking tripping on mushrooms gets you closer to the universe and makes you have better things to say. So, what maybe, are you saying? Exactly. What? Exactly. That's, that's are you why, tripping now? What are you talking about? That's why we don't <laughs> listen to Hippie Max because. He has no good points whatsoever. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we have the audio loud enough. Just just enough so that we can hear the terrible, terrible, terrible. God, the loving. delivery is awful. What yeah. they're saying does not make sense a lot. Or just like, it seems like it's trying to make sense, but then you become suspicious of like, what was that actually? <laughs> like, what are you covering up by saying that? Oh, here we're going to get one of these flashback scenes. Yeah, again, I mentioned it earlier, but these are kind of baked into the uh, into the uh, original short story. Also, we didn't mention that uh, this movie has some like decent, you know, on location stuff. Um, I think I like their their choice to use the like volcanic beaches, but like I wish there was more stuff that happened there, and I wish we got more interesting imagery with the beaches. Like, there's not as many like really cool composed shots. Like, can you imagine just seeing people walking down like a jet black like beach? That'd yeah, be cool. The black sand does contribute, I would say, aesthetically later on when like they're on the beaches and like it's just rainy and desperate and dark and sad. It, yeah, because it, it starts to look like they're on like the moon yeah, or something weirdly. It, it yeah. becomes more and more just like, oh God, we're in this terrible, terrible, dark, sad place. And here we get the flashback of us having important meeting in this weird fucking club. Yeah. And you know what? Does not answer the question of how they became friends. But we are going to see how shallow the CEO dude is. I hire people to think for me. Just use their thoughts. Now that takes talent. There's nothing wrong with borrowing talent. <laughs> See, I'm a capitalist. I just take all the hard work other people do, and I get rich off of it. And that's the real smart thing to do. Yes, exactly. I don't know why I'm using my 1920s your, radio your personality. Your transatlantic accent. <laughs> my fucking 1920s radio show host. You have a great Catherine Hepburn impersonation. It's true, everybody. If you ever meet Max in real life, you got to get him to do his Catherine Hepburn impersonation. This scene goes on for a little bit too long, especially like, I guess, I, I guess I get the point of like, we didn't have a lot of time to humanize our characters beforehand and establish what they were like before shit hit the fan. So we're doing that now in flashbacks. But at the same time, it also is just like, wow, it didn't, it took them that short of a time to just like get at each other's throats and want to start raping and murdering each other. Like, well, again, yeah, that gets to the problem where it's like, they're always shown as shallow it's sort of a problem with the conception of this movie where it works, where it's like, oh, we're just going to like contrast different types of like colonization and how that changes the way you behave. Yeah. But like, also it's like, it, it's a challenge for character stuff because you need there to be some substance if you want there to be like, you know, noticeably some sort of change when they arrive on the island. It just seems like they're shallow and assholes to begin with. They could have done this without there being a fucking mushroom island. 
There must be a reason they broke the mirrors in the middle of the woods somewhere. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, they should have just thrown them in the ocean, honestly. But it seems like it would be... Yeah, that way you don't have to look at it ever again. It'd be what such, if you accidentally see it in the forest? Yeah, it seems like such a chore to detach the mirrors from the boat, haul them all the way to the forest, and break them in the middle of the You're air. already next to the ocean. Come on, mushroom people, get your shit together. You know, he's got a neat hoodie he's wearing. <laughs> you mentioned that so much the other day. and was like, I mentioned it once. Lies. And I think, slayer. like, the thing about it is, like, it just looks like a hoodie that somebody would wear, like... Now? If they were, like... At the gym? Not that that makes sense, but like, it looks like a gym hoodie. (laughs) So yeah, this might be a good time to start talking about like the other interesting things I started noticing about like just the idea of using like this mushroom overgrowth as a metaphor. So uh, there are, are a number of neat things. The first being that, um, like capitalism, sort of, uh, mushrooms are kind of colonizers of different spaces and also plants in general, right? Plants, um, plants grow out of a specific spot. They're rooted to that spot, right? But how do they, how do they like, well, go to new areas? I think the fungus is a better metaphor for that because it just like continues to spread. It spores out and then it's just like, will continue to spread as long as there's nutrients it can extract wherever it goes. Right. And then when the, that particular thing can't extract anymore, it releases more spores and goes somewhere else. Right. That's yes. why it's of a concentrated form, but all plants really well, is they're like rooted at a certain area. And then it's like, they don't get up and move. They colonize, you know? So you have the original source and then you have new plants when there are seeds in different areas, like plants, like, let out their seeds and they travel wherever it's like a random distribution. They just look for wherever there's resources and fungus is like a very concentrated form of that where it literally when it's done, it spores out and, and then, and then it travels wherever there's going to be resources next. And that is a very like capitalist thing. Oh my God. That yet again, this is like, the we know we're in a movie line where it's just like oop, oh, oh, oh. see mushroom first mushroom person. But it's just like they look at the tree full of mushrooms and their first line of dialogue is, "Oh, if you were starving, I'd bet you'd take a chance on those, huh?" It's like what? Excuse I mean, they talked me? about it already, but I guess, I guess that's the thing. I don't know. It's not a big deal. It's just sort of like a weird, I know I'm in a movie line. And it does make me wonder, like, if there's some sort of cultural significance. We were talking about this of, like, mushrooms in Japan compared to the U.S. Like, are there different associations with them? Well, obviously, there's still a hallucinogenic thing. But I know, like, Japan is super, super strict on drugs. Like, right. it's not something you would ever even, like, like say you thought about doing. And I know we're looking at this through more of a, uh, I don't know. A, a, a type of um, a lens that's like social, economic, political. But I think you can, you know, other people might watch this movie and very easily make that connection with them eating the mushrooms and all their problems going away as like a type of drug. And I think that is appropriate, but yeah. I think it's more so in service of like the idea of ideological coloni- colonization having that effect Definitely. to a certain extent. And it was interesting. I was actually reading uh, that, that uh, auto not autobiography, but that biography of Ishiro Honda. And um, one of the things he said in a quote was that part of the inspiration of this them making this movie was reading about the story of rich kids who took their father's yacht out and then fucked it up somehow and had to get rescued. Okay. So it's interesting. It's like it, it communicates this idea of like this weird cultural amnesia for Japan of like, embracing westernization in america specifically and it's like this weird like cultural like i don't want to say like treachery but it's like you're just gonna do that after they like destroyed this place <laughs> like i can understand why you're like some people would condemn this movement towards you know americanization yeah <laughs> we have Whatever the fuck that was. If I guess I'm going to sneak into the woman's room. Well, okay, yes. We are big fans of Ishiro Honda. Yeah. He is not 
the best director when it comes to horror sequences or building tension. No. Well, also, we're not sure completely because I don't think either of us have seen the original cut of Mantango. Yeah. Um, because... Did you just say Mantango? That's a different movie. <laughs> That's the one I watched. Um, it's directed by Robert Duvall. But... No, Mantango is very, very different type of film. Um, <laughs> but for this cut, we have the scene coming up where we have all this tension building up where it's just like, Oh, there's a figure going by and what's, what's going on. And then like the scene ends. We'll get, we'll see it in about five minutes. Not even, but like, but it is kind of Scooby-Doo, especially with like the directions where you don't know who's going in what direction or what's going on. Right. (laughs) Also, another weird problem I had is like, I, I, that's a creepy image, though. It is, but why? <laughs> but then you're like, why are you doing that? Yeah. See how annoyed that guy is? That's justified. It's like, what the fuck are you doing walking around like weird, like mummies or whatever? <laughs> Done it. And again, when you have characters that are all basically different versions of the same idea, their motivations can be a little bit bleh as well. Yeah. I mean, basically all these characters are like the same character, which is young, shallow Japanese person who is very prepared to embrace like American capitalism and the stratification that comes with that at the expense of like CEO, Japan's past yeah, well, or whatever. CEO man is... He's not that young, but yeah, he's... Yeah. New generation, we'll say. But yeah, we were talking about the buildup of tension, and we keep having, like, false releases of tension, where it's like, oh, it's just this person, oh, it's just this person, but then, like, oh, we're getting this. I think you really expect it to be, you know, a tease in this moment, too. Where you're like, oh, God, he saw a mushroom person, but people aren't going to believe him when he says because, like, he was stealing and he was caught stealing. Yeah. Right. And you see that it's a mushroom person and you're like, oh, God, it's totally them. And he totally saw one. But then it's going to sort of build tension and drive a wedge between them when they caught him stealing. And then he refuses to tell the truth about it. Which would work them. for this movie, because as we've said, this movie is called Attack of the Mushroom People. There's no real attack of the mushroom people. So As far as we know, the mushroom person. Oh, here we go. <laughs> So, yes. So then we fade to this door, which I don't know what that means either. And then cut to commercial. No, fade to commercial. And now we're eating. What the hell happened? What? What? Excuse me? (laughs) And it's weird in this moment, too, that my response is the same thing initially as this, like, would-be rapist. Yeah. Where it's like, don't make me sympathize with this guy. Where my question is like, what the hell happened? Did he attack you or did he just go away? Did he disappear? Yeah. Did you shoot him? But now they're just calling it a ghost and that they're all hallucinating and it didn't happen. I don't care. I'm capitalist, man. I'm not going to do anything. We're, We're vain and shallow, so we have no principles when somebody starts talking about like assaulting somebody or raping. I mean, not even assault, just raping them. But then I'll decide I'm going to shoot you. Yeah. And then I have a knife for some reason. Yeah. This movie is interesting because it is Ishiro Honda doing this type of movie. That's not necessarily to say that he doesn't do it without being clunky and awkward at certain points. Well, there's only so many ways you can do like the Lord of the Flies, like, Once society is gone, people will eat each other type story. But like, meh. What twist would you put on it? I would say I would do the opposite. Once society is gone and you put these people in, they they have a great, they do a great job. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. This is like almost like a sort of a pro-anarchist movie. And then people try to get them and they're like, fuck you, we're not going. Yeah. And then they have to fight off these invaders who want to take them home. We got this great thing. 
going. Everything's better than the way we left it. A Girl Scout's airplane, cargo airplane, crashes in the Pacific. No, Girl Scouts are ruthless capitalists. They they would. <laughs> That's true. So, More so than Boy Scouts, probably. Yeah, well, Boy Scouts. When the last time you ever bought something from fucking Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts will break your kneecaps if you don't buy cookies. So they... Not that they have to. Yeah, exactly. That's the what makes them more effective <laughs> is that they you want to. You want to buy those cookies. Of course you do. I'm saying that the cookies become a type of currency <laughs> on the island. This is what I'm saying. There's some comedian talking about that where he was just like, I, there's a Girl Scout who said like, oh, you can buy one box for 10 or two for 20. And it's like, that's not a deal. So it's like, I never said it was. <laughs> Forever. Bye. And ever. <laughs> And ever. One of my coworkers' kids are, are Girl Scouts, and uh, they, my coworker lobbies hard for yeah. them at the office. <laughs> well, yeah, because his kneecaps are going to get broken if he doesn't sell enough to his coworkers. Oh. Is that where you thought we would be talking about those Girl Scouts breaking people's kneecaps? <laughs> I mean, honestly, movie? yeah. I mean, oh, well, here's the other question we talked about mushrooms. Yeah. Oh, okay, can we just interrupt this again? Why are you making us sympathize with the man who's taking action and trying to, like, galvanize these people, but he's also the would-be rapist? That's a little awkward, isn't it? I don't know if I like that. I think it's him trying to, like, reestablish the social order almost because he's right where it's just like, F- I don't care if you're rich back home. That means diddly squat right now. Like, But he's also... No, like, but I'm saying, so, like... We have like the altruistic thing of just like, we all need to pitch in so we can all survive. Right. You don't get to eat if you don't contribute something. But at the same time, he's jealous that these people have women and he's viewing women as a commodity. Yes. Almost where it's like, oh, you haven't contributed anything, but you have this woman. So I think by him trying to make it meritocracy, it's the selfish rapist in him being just like, oh, I'll get this woman if I become the most... Speaking of which, we're, we're watching these two women work right now. Yes. And we missed another, uh, you know, sort of phantasmagorical moment is uh, Akiko hearing the voice of her mother. We yeah. don't really hear that a lot, but that's an interesting one to have as well. Oh, that's a funny shot. Nope, that one's not good either. What is he digging for? Is he just trying to taste the dirt? No, <laughs> he's getting, they mentioned before, there's uh, grass and plants with uh, roots you can eat. And he, yeah. he smiled after he did that. He licked it and he's like, oh, oh i thought can... he gave a face like oh no good no i can i can eat this oh bummer <laughs> but yeah i think this movie does seem to have an awareness of um not just like you know attitudes towards women but the idea that like of a like american capitalist spectacle being gendered yeah you know it's only for men well yeah and this is something we talked about with other movies the idea that when like a straight white man is the primary consumer. It's like the system becomes discriminatory by proxy. It doesn't care. It doesn't have any intrinsic values. It just adheres to the, like it tries to please the primary customer. Right. Yeah. And in doing that, anybody who doesn't occupy the position of the primary customer can in men, in many ways become uh, an object for sale or something. Right. And that also, that's not just literally, that's like when, in terms of how we discuss things or how we think about different things, right? So yeah, when you see that like, like the kaleidoscopic sort of uh, thing when he eats the mushrooms and you see like, they look like Vegas showgirls basically, there's a reason why it's like women, you know? They're a commodity. It's not just that it's a male character. It's that it's not just that like women are a commodity. It's that commodities are sold via women, you know, and that idea of sex. It's like to a degree, but also like as we see these characters treat like a lot of them are just like, oh, why do you have a woman? What have you done? Right. I'm saying like that type of thinking, whether you're gendering like some sort of object in, in sort of like a feminine way to like like a sort of uh, appeal to a male gaze or the, the object itself as a woman, it amounts to the same thing eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Which again is like this idea of eating the mushrooms and internalizing. Right. Which is the other neat thing about like plants as a metaphor for that 
and just like certain societal like inherited behaviors in general is that like a plant overgrowth is always like an expression of time passing because plants don't get out of control you keep without saying the passage this and I know of time. Uh, you keep saying this and it's I know it's an annoying thing to bring up but fungus is completely different than plants just wanted to keep saying that. Yeah. But I mean, we can take that for granted, but I think it's yeah. true of plants in general. Yeah. The the mushroom thing is I think fits this even better. Right. You got all the turtle eggs. But I'm saying turtle eggs are the new currency in this world. Yeah. They're going to, that's literally going to be a conversation later. Yeah. Um, but yes, with plants, like there's a reason why we associate with like Ivy on the wall with like something being old or whatever. Right. Old and distinguished. Yeah. A plant that is like a growth, especially like an overgrowth is something that's associated with the passage of time, which is the only way in which, you know, traditional Japan in this movie or whatever Japan was before is being broken down. It's just with the steady progression of time, this stuff will keep growing on top of everything. And I guess that's the other interesting thing too, is like we might associate different plants or fungus with like growing at the expense of like themselves potentially. Yeah. Like there's no, Eventually, you'll run out of things that you can extract yeah, nutrients like, from. Yeah, they're like an exponential growth thing. So if they end up in a situation or niche that has no like natural check on their growth, they will explode and eventually end up killing themselves because of yeah. their own overpopulation. Just like capitalism. Yeah, it's like this weird assumption of infinite growth that doesn't actually exist. <laughs> this is why Snapchat like stocks are in the toilet even though they have what, like a bajillion, how many millions a, yeah, of users? A bajillion yeah. active users. Like. Because they don't, they don't see a clear way for the, like the value to increase. It's not the value you have. It's the value that will be in the future. How much will it grow? Yeah. And like another one thing, like you have video game markets and they're just like, Oh, well we're going to make all of our games like have microtransactions in them and you have to keep playing them because we're going to have seasons and you have to play every season. It's like people only have finite money and finite Fine. <laughs> time and whatever. Um, or finite. We can, yeah, yeah fuck it. Finite. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I say. Um, so like, it's like an ad jingle. You can't, <laughs> you can't just keep doing this and eventually people are just going to be like, Oh, I'm not going to play your game. And that's why like, even though video game companies are like making more money than they have in history, the like, stocks keep going down because shareholders are like, Oh, well you grew less than 80 billion percent this year. So obviously your company's right. going downhill. Yeah. There's no room for just stability. It's just like you have to keep going or you die. <laughs> That's a healthy way to run a business. God. I will say both of the women have like pretty neat looking outfits. Like especially for being on like a deserted island. Yeah, a grimy ship for days on end. Whereas the men just kind of wear jackets and glasses. Look at me. See, this is him. He's he contributed turtle eggs and more roots than the oh, other guy did. Oh, look at this writer. He's walking out of a David Dakota movie. <laughs> he looks like a Japanese Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's another mushroom connection, isn't it? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know if that's a fact to just assume he probably ate mushrooms. Uh, I was, I had him on my mind because there's a wonderful image of him just like shooting a typewriter with a revolver in the middle of winter. But he sure is a weird guy. I was named after him, actually. Are you shitting me? My middle name is Hunter after Hunter S. Thompson. Well, <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to name my kid after him, to be honest. My parents are both journalists, so he was an inspiration for both of them. Yeah. I guess he's a step up in the weirdness from like, or maybe a step down in the weirdness, depending on how you look at it from William S. Burroughs. Yeah. So I'm okay with it. I'm proud of it. <laughs> and yeah, see, we have literally just like almost the day of the dead or dawn of the dead moment where it's just like, um, Oh yeah. You just have this weird uselessness of currency where people like, write infinite checks. Blank checks I hope basically. I get back so I can, you know. so I can use yeah. this. Yeah. You never know. And then we have... Speaking of Dawn of the Dead, Ken Foray increasingly 
wears like like uh, wife beaters and that, and and you see like his gleaming muscles. And it's very sultry. He's like the Ken Foray, like he's a babe in that. Yeah. And in this, they're also very sweaty and sultry. And we have the culmination of like the. It's a reference. I've created this new meritocracy system and the attempt to gain women as the currency I deserve. And well, who's fighting him? Well, no, that's the guy. It's the the glasses man. The rapist guy is the one who came in and is mad. Oh, okay, yeah. So that's the culmination of that. Is like, I thought if I was the contributing the most, then I would get the woman because that's another. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think if the, I don't know if the movie communicates that though. I think this movie does have a slight motivation problem no i i think that's actually pretty clear upon a second watch is just like well he is the rapist he, he is, does openly no that's what talk i'm talking about this that's what i'm saying though is it's like he he openly talked about it but then he realized that he wasn't going to be able to do that because like everybody would band together to stop him and then he introduced like oh we all have to work for this and then like he shot a weird look at the girl when like he came back with the eggs and more roots than the other guy oh uh, yeah and then we have that where she's still sleeping with the other guy and the rapist is mad. I that guess that works. His whole system hasn't paid off. And I guess she's just a sociopath. Yeah. She doesn't care. She likes all the attention. <laughs> Everybody's fighting over me. Mm-hmm. Well, this shit just escalated. Yeah. We were talking, We were like, is that character kind of sexist? Not just in this movie, but in general. The idea of like the ultimate hedonistic bitch. Yeah, definitely. The woman who's just like, I don't care if I'm being used for male consumption. It's just like as long or as like I, that they live for that. Yeah, it's like as long as I get money and pleasures out of it, I'll be fine. No, that's. that's I mean, there's plenty of male characters like that too. Yeah, it's just but, not but, in reference to women. No, the women one is, oh, it's men wanting their cake, yeah, having their cake and fucking it too. Like it's, right, them like bastardizing woman for daring to enjoy male attention and sex, but at the same time, like wanting that. (laughs) Well, it's like the evil, like machinations of their like attempt to climb the ladder. Yeah. And it's always climbing the ladder. It's not like they're just at the top and they enjoy it and they're just hedonistic. They're not like divine. They're like, well, no, there's a different character. There's a different type of character for like the, that type of thing, almost the Marie Antoinette type thing, but, um, right. No, there's the, they're always climbing. Yeah, like like she said, I never loved you. I loved Europe. Yeah, like, yes, that's where she wants to go this entire time. Yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting because you can find all sorts of depictions of shallow asshole rich people, but there are always some patterns you can notice. Just kill him. Just kill him. He tried to shoot you. You're justified. It saves you guys food in the long run. I know you're going to kick him off the boat, but what does that do for you? Does he save them food? What if he dies, Max? This is the next question. They never get to this territory. Yeah. But would they eat him? And also, here's the real important question. Would you eat him? Well, no. If you're in this situation, who do you eat first? Um. Oh, billionaire. Man, definitely. Why? Uh, because he's probably the fattest. He's had like the most succulent diet. So I'm assuming that's going to, all these people are pretty skinny to me. They're skinny, but like he's the chubbiest out of all of them. So you get, you get more. No, fat. I think the writer is. Nah. And I feel like he's like, if you're going to be eating somebody, you want like a higher quality stock. You want like, you, you know, think he's bulk bread. He's yeah. grass fed is what yeah, you're he's saying. Gr- he's grass fed meat. So he's the type of human you would buy at like whole foods. No, like higher up, like a private, like, oh, meat market. Like that's, that's, he's high up there. You, you, you're spending a lot of money on that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who I would eat first. Maybe a Kirikubo. Cause he's been in some Kurosawa movies. <laughs> you want to help you and know, have some of that prestige rub off on you. Anyway. Yeah. I love how this guy is just like, how dare you suggest this? And then he does this the next scene. <laughs> well, I think his idea was like, Oh yeah, I guess he just does do that. He doesn't do it out, out of some like misguided sense of like, these people are weak, but I can maybe find help for them. And that's the best choice they have. No, he's just like, Oh, I'll take this guy's idea. But I Cause also, don't yeah. Him. At the end we see that like epitaph he wrote for himself. Yeah. Where he's like, Oh, these people are dead. He yeah. doesn't know that. No, well, I think yeah. I think that's him trying to absolve himself so he yeah, finds the responsibility. Boat. Yes. 
Somebody's like, oh, well, they, they were already dead when he left the island, so it's fine. It's weird how that never seems to work with, like, boat wreckages. Yeah. If you have, like, a boat wreckage with, like, a story or whatever. I mean, the one that I always think of is, like, Titanic. And how much people say, like, this was, like, we did the best we could, blah, 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 blah. And then they find it years later, and it's like, you were all lying. <laughs> you were all lying. Not that people necessarily bought that back in the day either, but. Dunna. Dramatic music. Now, Max, have yes. you ever gone out on a boat just on your own or anything like that? Uh, not a big boat, no. Small boat? Well, that like besides like kayaking and canoeing, no. Oh, where have you been kayaking? Does it matter right now? What's the point you're trying to make? I mean, I'm just curious. I'm not really trying to make a point. <laughs> Why did you bring up, if I had ever been on a boat then, what, what were you bringing up? I, I don't know. Okay, goddamn. But he's already left. I feel like it would be hard to move that entire boat with nobody noticing. Yeah, whatever. It's really foggy. You know what we haven't mentioned that's weird is like the explanation for these weird necklaces they have. They look like they're wearing like the necklace from the first Pirates of the Caribbean with the gold coin. Except that's clearly not it. Oh, look, she's all dressed up. Yeah, she's where, ready to go. Where'd she get that outfit from? Did the mushroom people make it for her? She's had, like, a number of outfits. These people haven't showered in weeks. Yeah. I don't think. So here's another interesting factor of, like, plant life and mushrooms and fungus that I think makes them interesting as, like, an image when they interact with like urban spaces and how like that relates to like a setting and the psychology of characters moving through it is the idea that, um, particularly in urban spaces, sort of, uh, greenery and growth is like marginalized. It's on the periphery. Yeah. You don't walk through like an area that doesn't have a path or something. No, it's just like trees. It's, it's decoration. Yes. But also that makes it weirdly like, I don't know. I don't know what the word would be like potent as an image of like ideology because it's kind of invisible to you as you walk through your everyday life. Until but it's it, also all around you. Until it steps out of its boundaries onto the places it's not supposed to be. Right. Yeah. Right. And then you're aware of it. So it's interesting. I think it's weird to think about, but there is an entire subgenre of plant horror, particularly around this time. Day of the Triflids. Uh Triffids. Is it Triffids? I thought it was Triffids. Uh, I mean, you could make that movie, but it is Triffids. Eh, you're, you could be entirely right. I saw that forever ago. Um, it's not like the most amazing movie either. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> but you've got that. You've got From Hell It Came. Oh, my God. You've got A this. Classic. You've got The Thing from Another World, our famous intellectual care. Oh, that's an on-the-nose shot. Look at that. The money ad. Whoa. Um, thing from Another World. You have uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, obviously the most famous one, with those pods, those seed pods. Yeah. It's a whole subgenre at this time. Godzilla versus Biolante? Um, yeah. Oh, weird. It's a weird noise. Well, anyway. Got some static feedback. Well, Biolante is not... That's like in the 80s, isn't it? No, that's later on. Yeah. That's... As long as we're talking about Godzilla and the Honda movies, I figured I'd bring it up. Do you think this is like a decent early example of like body horror? I know there's a lineage directly from this movie. Um, I think this story actually was adapted before the movie was made by EC Comics. Really? Yeah. So obviously the story had some sort of circulation just in horror communities, I'm sure, in uh, Western nations, not Japan. Um, as, as in addition to this movie, I know that this movie inspired Stephen King to write a story that I think wound up in, uh, the creep show movie where he actually played it and he turns into a mushroom person. No. Okay. Have you seen this? Um, he's like sitting watching TV and he turns into like a, a, a mushroom. Maybe. I don't There's, know. Where's my mushroom? No. Okay. I well, thought I knew what you're talking about, but no, I don't. It's not the best. 
But anyway, it is interesting to see this movie has sort of like an influence on stuff. And there's, a, there's actually a long history for like Japanese body horror. And it's like still a genre that's flourishing today with one of, <laughs> I'm not going to call him one of my favorite Japanese directors, but he's definitely my favorite uh, Japanese practical effects and makeup artist. Um, the guy who wore that fetus on his head at yeah, the red carpet. Yeah. Yoshihiro Nishimura. Um, who's, he is a legendary special effects artist in Japan, but like we might get around to doing Tokyo Gore Police eventually, but like, I would not recommend that as a good movie. I recommend that as a movie that if it, like that was the movie where I'm like, Oh, I'm never going to see a thing in a movie that will shock me again. Um, because if I can get through this without being shocked, then I'm kind of dead inside. But no, yeah, he's still doing it. I, I, I would recommend watching Tokyo or police and to a lesser extent hell driver, but, um, they're, they're interesting, weird movies. What do you think about this movie though as like a body horror um, thing? Not much. Right. I we like, don't get a lot of like viscera. No, of it, really. It, it doesn't revel in it. It doesn't like make you feel uncomfortable with how like this like if it really did this thing of like Although I guess I feel uncomfortable looking at this. I mean, look at her body. Yeah. She's like sweating so much. And yet she also has so much makeup on her face that she looks very weirdly porcelain. Yeah, I think she's supposed to look very artificial at this point. Like, yeah, she's like dripping and her makeup is still kind of like perfect. Yeah. It's very strange looking. I, I also think it's interesting um, to see certain like, I don't know, similarities with with the weirdness of, of like body transformation being associated with this type of like religious commitment to people doing that to themselves, because I think that's like a weird idea people can't handle is like transforming your body with like religious fervor. Yeah. And that's kind of what the writer and her become where it's not just about like them enjoying the mushrooms. They have to convert they have, the other people here. The others into doing yeah. Well, it makes sense because they've tried multiple, like the writers tried multiple times to like take them by force. Yeah. And it's not working. So it's just like, oh, what if we just tempt them with the same thing that we're doing? Yeah. We just have them do it. But even the idea that they have to get the other people to do it. Why do they care? They don't have to. Well, because they couldn't get their way through force. So, But why do they want to is my real thing. Well, the originally the writer wanted to fuck shy girl. But um, right now it now it's just I'm in cult of mushrooms. Yes, it's a cult thing. It's yeah. like, and in the way they're, they're they're like pacified, too. They're violent and then they're pacified. But even when they're violent, it's like pacified because they're like, auton automatons yeah. to a certain extent. There's a weird like mechanization of like their thought and behavior that I think is associated with the body transformation as well. I think you see that in some other, some other uh, body horror movies well, too. Yeah, well, a uh, hallmark of like body oh, here horror. Here we go. Yeah, a hallmark of body horror is more just like they would focus on it more and make you feel uncomfortable because that's like if there's some there are some body horror elements in this, but I wouldn't call it a body horror film by any stretch of the imagination. But yes, now we have the we have the neon spectacle and yes, these, women being presented as just like these Vegas. Flamingo showgirls. Yes. Which is once you've see you're participating in the capitalist fantasy now and everything can seem okay. And like it once was, and you'll be fine. Which also weirdly enough, these people just seem like circus performers, like doing these, like not these people, but like the one doing the flips. Yeah. It's like something about that is like, just weirdly like I'm more just like impressed by the fact she can do that while standing in the exact same spot. (laughs) but yeah you're not going to be hungry anymore but you have to become like the dirty Americans see you'll become a mushroom and that's a nice touch too I, yeah. this isn't the best uh, sort of uh, version of this I'm sure but like the f- the vi- like visual of like the spores floating through the air that looks really nice I wonder if they did that with the uh, optical printer as well where they just shot spore floating through the air and just printed it Mm. onto this could be but it does almost look like they're just sort of like pumping it through yeah and then we get the creepy laughter for the first time yes 
maniacal laughter, as they say in the subtitles. Is it maniacal, though? I think so. Also, um, so these these mushroom people, even though I think they're very creepy looking, um, people I think at the time thought they were very goofy and silly. Well, they kind of are because, like, if you're if you're ignoring the fact that these were once people and they've just sort of like been mutated into these weird things, he is kind of silly looking. Let's right. be honest, but he looks almost like something that you'd see like in a power like as a Power Rangers villain. Like, right. It's kind of silly. Um. But I'm okay with that. It's just, I for me, it's more like the direction of it, you know? I, I can understand why they might think the outfits are silly, but it's the fact that they're shot in sort of from a distance every time. We never see like a real close-up of a mushroom person. Yeah. But we do see that they don't chase him, really. They're just kind of standing there. It's so, something about them is so passive and neutered that it's creepy. Yeah. Well, they don't care because they know they've got him. Because like, like the woman said, once you stop, you can't. Or once you start, you can't stop. I think it's not even beyond like they've got him. It's that like they would never like take an aggressive action anyway, you know? Yeah. I wonder if like once you've like once you fully transformed, are you just like the con like constantly hallucinating? Are you just constantly in the state of euphoria? It would make sense why they're just constantly laughing whenever they're on the right. screen. It's like this. They've become synthesized with like the environment. Yeah. Stop being a hysterical woman, even though that's totally justified in this situation. Now, here's the other question that we were talking about when we were doing the prep screening is like, do you feel like they ever had a chance at like surviving? Like independently of these mushrooms and everything. Um, that's the thing to a degree. If like we had like brought the band together and also like if we adopted like the terrible rapist man's idea of having a meritocracy and everybody having to work for the survival of everybody without like, there's just some idea of cooperation. Yeah. But like without like his end goals of like, I'm going to do this to get women. Like if we had managed to do that earlier on, you would have a much better chance of surviving. Um, and I I think that would be a chance, but I think the movie wants to believe that there's more of a, like a possibility that that could happen. But I don't feel like you see a lot of like evidence of that. Throughout the movie, I feel like yeah. the movie doesn't like clearly indicate like here's some or they don't have a goal they're trying to do because it will help them survive in this way. And then they fail. Well, I think that it's just like we're going to survive, I guess. Well, that kind of, I think, speaks to the whole like if we're going with like the harkening back to like, oh, we want to go back to the way things used to be. Right. This is a time when Japan had lost its identity to a degree. And it's just like we can't really go back to the way things were because like we tried that and we lost and it was terrible for a lot of people. So like, what, what do we do? What are we really going to do? So like if the movie, I I might have a problem with the movie if they did a bit more of just like, Oh, if we just do this, then we'll, I don't know. I think that would be like sort of like, Oh, all we have to do is try to have go back to Imperial Japan era, which is not a popular idea in Japan. I mean, I don't necessarily think them, Working together is like that. No, but, but uh, I, I don't know. In the framework, I would say I would, I wouldn't. Yeah, but that's not the movie. That's the frame I'm looking through it. Um, I guess yeah, you can look at it at two different levels. But yeah. in terms of like having a movie that like on the first order of logic is Makes, more propulsive, maybe yeah. is like you give them a chance to succeed, and maybe you can better demonstrate the ways in which they've internalized this vapid and not helpful ideology. Um, that makes them sort of compete with one another more than try to help one another. You, maybe you can demonstrate that more clearly by giving them a goal on this island that yeah. they fail in their own unique way. I don't know. Something like that. Do you? Does this movie remind you in any way really of uh, stuff like Battle Royale? Kind of. Um, battle she ro- eating sticks, by the way? No, they're like roots. Um, oh, okay. But, uh... Dun, dun, dun. Yes, no. Sorry, I was... That was a moment of just like, oh, they're running out of food now. But, um... Anyway, uh... Battle Royale's more... 
They are trapped on an island. Yeah, well, there's that. That's the obvious yeah. thing. But I'm talking about, like, thematically and, like, what they're doing on the island. Not really. I think that you can maybe draw a connection in the sense that I think this movie is implying that, like, the system has created both of these things and that you don't get one without the other. Although that's more direct in Battle Royale, where it's like, we have to do this each year. Well, yeah, the battle. Ro- that's, yeah, that's the th- that's also the difference. Between- it's like these people didn't necessarily have to suffer at this island. It's just that this island exists for the same reason that Tokyo now exists in the way it is. Yeah, battle royale is more just like I guess you could see the theme of like it's authority crushing rebellion, but like, but there is a spirit of rebellion in yeah. that. And this these people are just they're they've abandoned they're themselves. Defe- yeah, they're defeated. And really, again the thing we've said this entire time is like this movie is more of like a realization of how much they've abandoned themselves more than it is like it actually happening to them. Oh, her hat is finally, is finally coming apart. Oh, oh my God. Okay. Jeez, dude. Fine. I'll leave. Max, do you think mushrooms are a good scary choice for this? Or is there like a more frightening type of uh, plant or something, you know, vegetation or something? I mean, M. Night Shyamalan tried the happening. Um, That didn't really work out that well. I guess that wasn't a specific plant, though. It was the hallucinogenic spores from trees, if I remember. No, 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 no. It's the plants communicating with one another. Ah, okay, whatever. I saw the happening fucking forever ago, and I remember thinking it was stupid. (laughs) It was really bad. Newsflash. I was right. Lots of people mm-hmm. agreed with you. Oh my god. <laughs> he dropped that arm prop on the ground. Max, that's a reference to Jurassic Park. <laughs> Preemptively. Yes. I love these clever filmmakers that can reference movies that haven't been released yet. Yeah, it's that's 30, my favorite thing. 30 years down the line, somebody's going to do this. So I'm going to reference that. Yeah. What does it mean? When that Sam Jackson in that movie completely changes the situation. Also, uh, one other interesting detail I did not mention is I believe the name of their yacht at the beginning is Ahu Dore, which sounds like the end of the Grinch, but no, <laughs> I think it means albatross. Sure. Which makes sense in this situation, kind of. I mean, I don't know what they're saying about like the rhyme of the ancient mariner, but it's yeah. an albatross around your neck. And oh, maybe you could say that they're in for like a fate worse, the life in death, or yeah. life like worse than death. Just like the mariner himself. Amara. And that Akira Kubo, much like the mariner telling his story to the wedding guests, will have to re- tell like scientists or whatever about his horrifying story. Well, this is the closest there, we get there to you a, go. get to an attack. And really, it's just a wrestling thing. They're just trying to get the gun out of him, out of his hands. So the, the, and they kidnap the girl so that she can become a mushroom person, too. So at this point, would you eat the mushrooms, Austin? Would you still be trying to... If you're running out of food, you can't even scavenge. If I was a mushroom person? No. Or if if you, I was a Kirakubo here? Yeah, like, you're running out of food. There's not any options... Left, would you just eat the mushrooms at this point? I think I'd just fucking kill myself. Or maybe just swim. I'd just yeah. swim out of there. Just try to get on the yacht. Just grab things on the way. Because I'm just like, I'm. you know what, I guys, I, I'm not like the biggest fan of mushrooms anyway. <laughs> you know. That's cool. Do your thing. I'm not a narc. You guys can do mushrooms by yourself. Yeah, like, I'm not going to call anybody. But like, uh, tell them that you're doing this. It's yeah. fine. I'm cool, guys. I'm cool. <laughs> I think I might take the mushrooms at this point. Just be like, yeah, the mushroom people seem pretty happy. Why not? I don't know if they they're happy though. They're laughing so much. They're having a great time. That's true. But like, you don't know. This is the thing: is that they're becoming something different that we can't entirely relate to. Yeah. Right. It's like, I don't know the interiority of a mushroom person. So I'm guessing what I'm really asking is like, would you indulge in capitalism at this point? If everything else is hopeless. 
I mean, I don't know. But that is the scary thing about Invasion of the Body Snatchers, too. It's like they say that it's just the same, right? Yeah. But it's like, but I don't know that it's just the same. Yeah. And clearly you seem slightly different somehow. So no, I don't trust you. And you know what is weird that people, I, I think, talk about less with why that's intimidating? With at least a vegetative growth thing and then like mimicking you is like the reproduction of of these mushroom spores and everything is like entirely sexless. Yeah. Which is disturbing in its own weird way. And is another reason why I think like subconsciously you were, you're like intimidated by the idea of transforming into a mushroom because it takes the sex away. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they nobody's just, gonna have sex with that. Well it's not just that, it's that I mushrooms know. don't have it's asexual reproduction. Yeah. I know. I was making a bad joke. You know what? I would say that's a Lynn Manuel Miranda quality joke. That's not even You have nothing to be ashamed of. That's nobody's even gonna get that. <laughs> <laughs> People have forgotten the stupid shit we said at the beginning of this movie. I think we cut that out. <laughs> no, we didn't. Yeah. Well, if we did, that's gonna be real weird, isn't it? Yeah. Well, anyway, I think the shot of her legs is the closest thing we're going to get. And also, I know we talked about this, but it would have been interesting to get like, maybe this was not in their ability to pull this off at this point, but it would have been real neat to get a moment where somebody kills a mushroom person or like cuts their head off. Oh, yeah. And the moment they die, it just like spores all over them. Sort of like an alien acid blood situation. Yeah. That would have been horrifying to see. Like, oh, you can't kill them. You're just going to make more of them. Yeah. Damn yourself. Especially if you're right next to one. Well, especially since, like, the ending where like, he's shooting the mushroom people, like, you don't really need that. And, like, if you do that, like, have, like, one of the guys shoot him and then just, like, he becomes one. And then the like, girl's like, oh, we have this gun, but it's fucking useless. Who cares? Like, right. the thing that was so threatening to the humans are nothing to these people. And then we get the desperation of going. There he goes. I think that's a lovely image, too. This this little uh, silhouette of this boat. And he somehow gets rescued and brought back to Japan. Yep. Now, the other weird thing that um, we missed right at the beginning is in the prologue bit, you see both sides of his face. Yes, and we have differing opinions on this. Um you were saying that it developed while he was telling his story? Yes, because, like, he's in a psychiatric ward, and, like, he's telling this long, long story about it, and, like, we see the outline of his face before, and he doesn't have any visible, like, growths or whatever, but I think the whole thing is just, like, oh, like, it's been growing on him since then. You think that it's just inconsistent filmmaking and them not wanting to... Well, I also away. think I read something about, like maybe some anecdotal story about them not being sure about what the ending would be while yeah. they were shooting it. So maybe that's it as well. But also I think it's easy to overlook like the, the nice bit of the framing device where at the beginning you see it's kind of twilight zone esque. It's kind of like you see him in this room and you think it's just like a stark apartment. And then it's just like, no, there's bars there. It's all the same. Yeah. So that's the ultimate thing of this movie. It's a little bit on the nose, but it's interesting. And it's a different take on this type of material than you see uh, Honda usually go with. And I think that's it's really it's dark. something to look at. And it's a much bleaker ending than yeah. a lot of his work. I mean, the original Gojira has a somewhat of a kind of... There's like a future. End. It's not like the story is definitively now over and yeah. it's like he's trapped there forever. So yeah, interesting movie. Do you have any final thoughts on this movie? Anything like that? Um, even if you don't want to indulge in like our Western capitalist critique analysis of this film, and you just want a different kind of like 50s, 60s era, almost monster flick, I think this is a very interesting one to check yeah. out. If you're in it solely for like, monster fights and whatnot you're gonna be deeply disappointed by this there's movie. no attacking in this movie sorry yeah so don't go in expecting that but 
it's a very interest. And if you're open to that kind of critique, I think that's a very interesting lens to look at this movie through. And if you're a fan of Honda, I think this is an overlooked movie that you should definitely check out. Yeah. So yeah, I would pretty much say the same. And uh, this has been Attack of the Mushroom People. Maybe one day we will revisit this if we get a chance to watch Matango. And do a compare and contrast between the two cuts. And for that time, we will be able to prepare some mushroom cocktails. Or not. I don't know. Max doesn't seem pleased with that idea. So maybe not. You can have a mushroom cocktail. I'll take some hallucinogenic mushrooms and with our powers combined, we'll make the worst podcast ever. Well, I look forward to that. Okay, but if you don't want to listen to the worst podcast ever, if you want to listen to our mediocre podcast, we're spectator yeah, it's not film even the podcast. Worst, it's just mediocre. Yeah, um, <laughs> we are available at spectatorfilmpodcast.com, dot com, also on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. We have episodes every week, so tune in. Um, and yeah, if you have a movie you want us to do, reach out. Let us know. We'd love to hear what kind of things you'd like to hear us talk about. And with that. I think I need to get going. And so goodbye. Go. Oh, do you want to do that again? No. Okay. <laughs> let's Matang get out of here. Let's Matang and go. Go. <laughs> <laughs>